It's a pleasant winter afternoon. Kate and her two children are driving home after a Saturday morning soccer game. Everything is as it would be on any other day. But what if, for a moment, Kate is distracted by something? Let's see what can so easily happen. Two-year-old Oliver, in the back seat, is badly shaken, but he's unhurt. His 10-year-old sister Emily is not so lucky. The impact of the crash has shattered her fourth vertebrae, leaving her paralysed. Worse still, their mum Kate has severe injuries and the isolated location of the crash means that she'll die before paramedics can reach her. How do you explain this tragedy to Kate's family? Who's responsible for the misery unleashed by this brief, violent episode? Was it really Kate's fault? Surely there's a better way to understand the crash and more importantly, to stop it happening again. People make mistakes every day. That's part of being human. But on the road, those mistakes can easily turn to tragedy. In the late 90s, a group of Scandinavian researchers decided to look closely at how death and serious injury occur on the road. They found that most crashes aren't the result of extreme behaviour, but are the result of ordinary people making ordinary mistakes. So they proposed a fundamentally different approach. They called it the safe system. The safe system doesn't blame drivers for the devastation of the crash. It's proactive, asking how we can reduce risk and make the whole system more forgiving so that mistakes don't cost lives. The safe system takes what we know about people, how we think and act, and puts that in the centre of how we design and operate our road transport system. There are four areas that the safe system focuses on. Road users, on roads and roadsides, on our vehicles, and on the speeds we drive at, and how these all link together. Under a safe system, we strengthen every part of the road system. So if something does go wrong, whether it's the speed, the car, the roadside, or the driver, the rest of the system picks up the slack and it doesn't result in serious injury or loss of life. Serious road trauma is preventable. For example, we see more scrapes and bumps at roundabouts than at regular intersections. But the slower speeds and more forgiving impact angles make the crashes more survivable. The safe system is not just about reducing crashes. It's about saving us from death or serious injury. In a safe system, a crash is not necessarily someone's fault. It's a system failure. Safety is everyone's responsibility. Drivers, politicians, town planners, engineers, educators, vehicle manufacturers and importers, we all have an important role in creating a safe road system. The safe system shows us that people don't need to die on the roads. Crashes will still happen, but a safe system makes those crashes survivable. So if a person is involved in a crash, they can walk away rather than be carried away. Let's return to Kate and her children and look at what went wrong and what difference a safe system would have made. Kate is probably a good driver, but in retrospect, there were human errors that contributed to the crash. She could have been an autopilot because she drives that stretch of road very often. She may have been distracted by Oliver's cries from the back seat and she may have been tired after a busy morning. We're only human, and part of being human is making mistakes. We could be inexperienced, not paying attention, stressed, or breaking the rules. Even if all of us obeyed the rules all the time, we'd still make mistakes, leading to crashes. But with the safe system, mistakes made by the driver don't have to result in death or serious injury. The road Kate was travelling along is a typical Tasmanian road. A lot of crashes happen on rural roads that are very similar to this one. If the shoulder of the road was sealed, Kate may have had time to correct her path before she drifted onto the unsealed verge and lost control. If there was a rumble strip to mark the side of the road where the shoulder begins, it would have given Kate an early warning of trouble. It was the impact with the tree that killed Kate. If that roadside hazard wasn't there, or had been protected by a guardrail, then Kate would have had a different kind of crash. And most likely, she would have survived. 
Kate was driving a typical 1990s car. It had almost no modern safety features, giving her very little protection in the crash. The only modern safety feature was the child restraint, and that child survived. What if Kate's car had been safer, with a four or five star safety rating? Here's what happens to a modern five star car in a head-on crash. The airbags deploy and the passenger cell stays intact. Compare that to a three star car. This is actually a little safer than Kate's, but still the passenger compartment starts to collapse, putting the driver at risk of severe chest and leg injuries, the windscreen pops out and the dashboard is forced back into the passenger space. To see how far things have come, see what happens to a supposedly rock solid 1959 Chevrolet. And here's how its modern counterpart fares in the same crash. All these safety features make the crash that much more survivable for everyone. One of the areas of the safe system is speed. We need to look at the features of the road and set the speed accordingly. And it isn't just about the speed limit. It's important that drivers understand their responsibility to drive to the conditions. No one wants to be a bad driver, but we all make mistakes from time to time. And when we're driving a car, even a single mistake can lead to injury or death. We are all vulnerable. We're simply not able to withstand the forces of a 100 km per hour crash. We were designed to withstand forces more like falling out of a tree, not coming to a sudden stop in a tonne of metal travelling at 27 metres per second. If the speed limit on the road was 80 km an hour, instead of the rural default speed limit of 100, her car would have hit the tree 20 km per hour slower, or she might not have hit it at all. Even though Kate may have been distracted by what was going on in the car, if all the other elements of the safe system were improved, Kate would be alive, Emily would be back playing soccer next weekend, and Oliver would grow up knowing his mum. That's a total of five risk factors eliminated by a safe system, each one reducing the chances of serious injury or death. We do tend to accept the road toll. Even the word toll implies it's a price that we're willing to pay. Currently, 1.3 million people worldwide die from road crashes each year. This total is equivalent to six and a half jumbo jets crashing every single day. If planes crashed that often, we wouldn't fly. Yet we accept the road toll as the price we pay for mobility. The safe system is a harm minimisation approach. It looks at the system as a whole and asks, what can we do? How can we strengthen all those different parts to make the system safer? The safe system allows for the human factors in our road system, realising we all make mistakes and recognising that our bodies are fragile. It asks how roads and roadsides can be made more forgiving of human error. It looks at how the vehicles we drive can be improved to prevent crashes and protect us from harm if a crash does occur. And it ensures the speeds we travel at are appropriate for the roads we travel on and for the other people who use those roads. The safe system is a proven approach. It's getting great results internationally, significantly reducing road trauma. The Road Safety Advisory Council believes in the safe system approach. Our vision is to achieve zero deaths and serious injuries on Tasmania's roads. The beauty of this simple but profound new approach to safety is that we all have a part to play. Each of us can help reduce the risks we all face in getting around every day. If we can do that, then we can look forward to a future where no one is hurt or killed on Tasmanian roads, thanks to a truly safe system.